Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Today's episode is called The Goldilocks Killings. Setagaya family murder refers to the unsolved murders of the Miyazawa family in the Kamisoshigaya neighborhood of Setagaya, Tokyo, Japan. Sometime after 11 p.m. on December 30th, 2000, Mikio Miyazawa, 44, his 41-year-old wife, Yosuko, their 8-year-old daughter, Naina, and their 6-year-old son, Rei, were killed by an unknown intruder. The attack was ferocious. While the killer was stabbing Mikio, his knife broke. Part of the sashimi knife's blade was found in Mikio's head, so he used one of the kitchen knives in the home to kill Yasuko and Nina. Yasuko was stabbed so viciously in her chest and head that her bones were visible. Japanese police launched a massive investigation that uncovered the killer's DNA and many specific clues about their identity, but the perpetrator has never been identified. The media frenzy and long investigation of the murders, which attracted a lot of public attention and discussion to abolish the statute of limitations for crimes that could merit the death penalty in Japan, which was removed in 2010. Yasuko's mother, who lived next door, found their bodies on the morning of New Year's Eve. Unable to reach her daughter, their phone had been disconnected, presumably by the killer. She unlocked the front door of their house and made a gruesome discovery, the body of her son-in-law, Mikio, lying at the bottom of the stairs, covered in blood from multiple stab wounds. She continued up the stairs and found the body of her daughter covering her dead granddaughter. Ray's body was lying on a bunk bed in the adjacent bedroom. Unlike the others, he had been strangled. Yasuko was a tutor and Mikio was working for a British marketing company. Nina was in second grade. Ray was a kindergartner. Investigation of the crime scene by the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department TMD, concluded that the family had been murdered on December 30th to 31st at around 11.30 p.m. to 12.05 a.m. midnight JST, after which the killer stayed in the house for several hours. Takashi Sachida, the chief of Seiho Police Station, was designated as the person in charge of the investigation at the time until his retirement. The killer entered through the open window of the second-floor bathroom at the rear of the house, located immediately adjacent to Sashigaya Park, and gained access by climbing up a tree and then removing the window screen. The killer used his bare hands to strangle Ray, who was sleeping in his room on the second floor, killing him through asphyxiation. Mikio rushed up the first-floor stairs after he detected the disturbance in Ray's room, fighting and injuring the killer until being stabbed in the head with a sashimi bocho knife. A police report claimed that part of the sashimi knife's blade broke off inside Mikio's head. The killer then attacked Yasuko and Nina with the broken knife, before using a santoku knife from the house to murder them. The killer remained inside the house for two to ten hours, using the family computer, consuming four bottles of barley tea, melon, and four ice creams from their refrigerator, using their toilet and leaving his feces in it without flushing, treating his injuries using first aid kits and other sanitary products, and taking a nap on a sofa on the second floor living room. Drawers and papers were ransacked, with some being dumped in the bath and toilet, and some money was taken, although more was left behind. The killer also left ten items behind on the family sofa, knife, scarf, hip bag, sweater, jacket, hat, gloves, shoes, and two handkerchiefs. An analysis of Mikio Miyazawa's computer revealed that it had connected to the internet the morning after the murders at 1.18 a.m. and again at around 10 a.m., Around the time Yasuko's mother Haruko entered the house and discovered the murders, Haruko became suspicious after being unable to call her daughter, 
the killer had unplugged the phone line and visited the house but received no answer after ringing the doorbell. Authorities believe the killer had stayed in the house until at least 1.18 a.m., but the computer usage at 10 a.m. could have also been triggered by Haruko accidentally moving the mouse during her discovery of the crime scene. Police have been able to deduce several very specific clues to the perpetrator's identity, but have been unable to produce or apprehend a suspect. It was determined that the killer had eaten string beans and sesame seeds the previous day after analyzing feces from the killer in the Miyazawa's bathroom. They determined that the clothes and sashimi knife left behind by the killer had been purchased in Kanagawa Prefecture. Police also learned that only 130 units of the killer's sweater were made and sold, but they've only been able to track down 12 of the people who bought the sweaters. Trace amounts of sand were also found inside the hip bag that the perpetrator left at the scene, which after analysis was determined to come from the Nevada desert, more specifically the area of Edwards Air Force Base in California, and a skate park in Japan. Investigators found the killer's DNA and fingerprints throughout the house, but none match their databases, indicating that they do not have a criminal record. Physically, the killer is believed to be around 170 centimeters tall and of thin build. The police estimate the killer was born between 1965 and 1985, 15 to 35 years old at the time of the incident, due to the physicality required for entering the Miyazawa house and committing the murders. The Miyazawa's wounds indicate that the killer is likely to be right-handed. The killer's blood was gained during an analysis of the murder scene that revealed traces of type A blood, which would not have belonged to the Miyazawa family. A DNA analysis of the type A blood determined the killer is male and possibly mixed race, with maternal DNA indicating a mother of European descent, possibly from a South European country near the Mediterranean or Adriatic Sea, and paternal DNA indicating a father of East Asian descent. It is considered possible that the European maternal DNA comes from a distant ancestor from the mother's line rather than a fully European mother. Analysis of the Y chromosome showed the haplogroup O, M122, a common haplogroup distributed in East Asian peoples, appearing in 1 in 4 or 5 Koreans, 1 in 10 Chinese, and 1 in 13 Japanese. These results led to TMD to seek assistance through the International Criminal Police Organization as the killer may not be Japanese or present in Japan. The investigation into the murders is among the largest in Japanese history, involving over 246,044 investigators who have collected over 12,545 pieces of evidence. All evidence related to the case remains in custody. As of December 2021, there is still a 20 million yen reward for information leading to the arrest of the killer. In 2015, it was reported that 40 officers were assigned to the case full-time. In 2019, it was reported that 35 officers are still assigned to the case. Every year, the TMPD makes a pilgrimage to the house for memorial ceremonies. Takashi Sachida, the chief of Seiho Police Station, was designated as the person in charge of the investigation at the time until his retirement. Again, the amount of physical evidence the killer left behind is staggering. According to Tokyo Police, that evidence included the following articles of clothing. A gray crusher slash bucket hat, a baseball shirt drenched in blood from at least one of the victims that was white with purple sleeves, one of only 130 sold in Japan. A cheap plaid scarf, a jacket, black gloves, two black handkerchiefs, one with a hole in the middle and wrapped around a kitchen knife, one of the murder weapons. Police believe the killer used the other one as a mask. They identified cologne on the cut handkerchief as the popular Drakkar Noir men's fragrance. 
a gray and black fanny pack. Based on a footprint at the scene, the killer was wearing size 11 white running shoes manufactured in South Korea. No shoes of this size were sold in Japan. Other evidence belonging to the killer. The aforementioned feces, fingerprints, shoe prints, blood, and blood stains. Police also found an open first aid kit and sanitary napkins soaked in the killer's blood. It's believed he used them to treat his own wounds. Details about the killer. About 5 feet 6 inches tall, slender, based on the 32-inch waist of his fanny pack, type A blood, right-handed, between 15 and 35 years old. No motive has been established, and none of the theories suggested over the years is particularly convincing. Money. Some of Yasuko's tutoring money was missing, and there has been speculation that the intruder, possibly a hired killer, might have believed he could somehow access the money the Miyazawas made from selling their house. But the killer did not take all of the family's cash, close to 250,000 yen, just under $2,000, was found at the scene. Angry skateboarders, I kid you not, police reportedly even investigated whether Mikio's alleged complaints about the noise from the nearby skate park made someone furious enough to kill his entire family. Some people have even made a gargantuan leap between skateboarders and Dracker Noir Cologne. Revenge, I've only seen this theory espoused by Redditors, bloggers, and podcasters, with no factual evidence or insight to support it. The house where the Miyazawa family was killed is still standing, despite the initial plans to demolish it after they moved out. Three years ago, Yasuko's older sister and Iri opened the house to reporters. In the video of that tour, you can see dozens of boxes containing the family's belongings that had been returned by police to the victim's surviving families. Some of the Miyazawa's furniture remains and penciled lines on one wall document the children's growth. A round plaque with their names surrounded by flowers hangs on the outside wall by the front door. Police considered it significant that a two-foot-tall Buddhist statue was found in April 2001 near the Miyazawa house. They distributed more than 30,000 flyers featuring a picture of the statue, a Jaizo Bodhisattva considered to be a guardian of dead children. The statue was found on the side of a road running alongside a river at the back of the house on the morning of April 9, 2001. Investigators said they believe someone left it there that morning or the previous evening and that the person might know something about the murders. Jaizo Bodhisattva, a Buddhist enlightened being, is popularly regarded as the guardian of unborn, aborted or stillborn babies and of children who die prematurely. He is usually depicted as a child monk. The statue is 59 centimeters tall and weighs about 20 kilograms. It has a mark on it that looks like the Chinese character meaning six. The grandmother reflected that Nina was a clever and active young girl. The eight-year-old was in second grade at school and a year ahead in her studies. Her grandmother Setsuko fondly remembers how much she loved her and ballet. Nina loved to show me her moves. She was just a bright and adorable child, she said. Nina's six-year-old brother Ray lived with a mental disability, and his parents surrounded him with love and support. Inside her home, she keeps a shrine to the family and still prays for them. She has all of their toys on display in a cabinet. I always wonder how they would have grown up. My biggest regret is that I never got to see them grow up, she said. She still cannot remember the family's funeral. She was told she was so traumatized that she could not walk and had to be carried inside. Why would they kill the children as well? If someone held grudges, they could just kill the adults, she said. I just don't understand why. I really don't. It's a question still seared in the mind of 72-year-old Takashi Sachida, who was at that time the chief of police on the case. 
The now-retired police chief played an integral role in the case and cannot let it go. An officer for 41 years, he rose to the ranks of chief officer at the CGO police station, the force tasked with investigating the family's murder. The facial expressions from the bodies he inspected still remain seared into his memory. They have furious facial expressions. They are mortified and regretful. I imagine that all of the victims felt the same way, just feeling regret. Even though he has been retired for 11 years, he is still unofficially working the Setagaya family murder case. When I think about the feelings of the victims' families who lost their loved ones all of a sudden, I just couldn't pass on this case to my successors after working as an officer for 41 years, he said. What could I do as a civilian? I could no longer carry out the investigation or put handcuffs on the criminal, but I had a lot of knowledge about this case. So I made my own flyers which ask for information. He visits the scene regularly to stay familiar with the details. But there are some details he will not and cannot ever forget. When I think about the brutality in the way he murdered the four, I just wonder, how could a sane person carry out such an extreme crime, he said. He slashed them from above the chest to the face as if he tormented them. It was extremely brutal. And the way he finished them off in the very end. It was so horrific. We couldn't show those scars to the devastated victims' families. There are no other cases in which the victims have been cut up like this, he said. Police have many clues about the killer's identity and what happened that night. Some officers believe the killer climbed up a tree, removed a screen, and then entered the open window of the second-floor bathroom. But the exact point of entry still is not clear. Their home backed onto Sashagaya Park, giving the killer several possible points of entry. They have the killer's fingerprints and DNA, which so far have not recorded any hits in Tokyo police databases. They know that the sweatshirt he left was only manufactured and sold 130 times, but officers have only ever been able to track down 12 owners. They have his blood, which revealed the killer was male and potentially mixed race, most likely of Korean or Chinese heritage. They know through his footprints that his shoes were probably made in Korea, in a size that was never sold in Japan. They believe he was slim, because the bum bag he left behind indicated his waist was between 70 and 75 centimeters. They even know that he ate string beans and sesame seeds the day before because he left feces in the bathroom. It's been 19 years and despite so many clues left behind, the fingerprints and the DNA of the criminal, why can't we find him? Takashi Sachita wondered. For the former police chief, there are too many questions left unanswered. Why did he enter a room that was lit? We look at each action and think, why? Was it for money? Did he have grudge against somebody in the Miyazawa family? Or was it about something else? Because the investigation cannot work out the motivation of the killer, police cannot narrow their focus. One avenue of investigation looked at whether Mikio had been seen arguing with skaters at the nearby park in the lead-up to his murder. The killer's clothes and suspected age could suggest a disgruntled skater tired of the neighbor's noise complaints who took matters into his own hands. But there are other, more outlandish theories. Investigative journalist Fumiya Ichihashi has spent years researching the case and wrote a book concluding the killer was a former South Korean army soldier turned killer for hire. He believes one of the killer's motivating factors was an attempt to steal compensation money paid to the family over the expansion of the nearby park. As the criminal left behind his knives, clothes, bag, fingerprints, palm prints, and footprints without care, I couldn't help but think that he was confident he would not get caught, Mr. Ichihashi said. He believes police officers failed in their initial investigation. 
When the incident happened, the special investigators at the Tokyo Metropolitan Police were all working on different cases, and it had no choice but to send their reserve team, he said. Also, as it was New Year's Eve, many detectives were at home and it took time to send the investigators. We can't deny the possibility that this led to an unresolved case. Grandmother Haruko, who found the victims, initially told police she had unlocked the door using her spare key, but in her later years was not so sure. This has made it much harder to confirm exactly how the killer entered and exited. Mr. Ichihashi said because police could not confirm basic details, no matter how good detectives may be, they would not be able to arrest the criminal. Unless there's a miracle and the criminal surrenders himself or his fingerprints match, if he commits another crime, I believe there is no chance he will be arrested, he said. Japanese police are not great with international cooperative investigations because of a lack of experience and language skills. Takashi Suchida disputes the author's take. It's 100% nonsense, Mr. Suchida said. If the book was true, the criminal would have been caught. It's okay if it was a fictional novel, but I have strong doubts calling it nonfiction. The case is now in the hands of a detective decades younger than Takashi Suchida. Manabu Ide, from the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Special Investigative Task Force, remains confident the case will ultimately be solved. I don't think there is any detective who is not confident, he said. It's our mission to arrest the criminal who murdered four innocent people, including two young children, and make him atone for his crime. Superintendent I'd said investigators would like to help the victims rest in peace. It's an atrocious case rarely seen in Japan's criminal history, and we think solving this case will help prevent similar crimes happening in the future, he said. The investigators who first worked on the case have now retired, and the family fears time is running out. Police now want to demolish the house which has been preserved for 19 years, because it is so old and at risk of collapse. Superintendent I'd said they had preserved all of the possible evidence inside, so there would be no impact on the investigation if the home was torn down. Can the new people who haven't experienced the graphic crime seen themselves focus on the investigation? I feel worried, former police chief Suchida said. Still, Takashi Suchida believes because they have the DNA, there is always hope of a breakthrough. He stays in close contact with Setsuko, Mikio's mother. On a recent visit to Setsuko's home, he brought a meal he had prepared for her. He said hello, then immediately knelt down at the family shrine, lit incense, and prayed. For Setsuko, she desperately hopes for answers while she is alive. When my husband died, the case was still unresolved, and that troubled us the most, she said. Now that he's gone, I feel I have to work hard by myself. Photos of the Miyazawa family hang in her room, and she waits for the day she can tell them the criminal is caught. In 2015, an Airi, older sister of Yasuko Miyazawa, filed a complaint to the Broadcast and Human Rights and Other Related Rights Committee of the Broadcasting Ethics and Program Improvement Organization after she claimed that the TV Asahi documentary aired in 2014 misrepresented her. After a TV Asahi reporter and ex-FBI agent used profiling to back a theory that the killer murdered the Miyazawas out of resentment. In 2019, the TMD announced that the Miyazawa house will be torn down because of its age and risk of collapsing with the interior already showing signs of deterioration. Police said that demolishing the house would have no impact on the investigation, as all evidence from the interior had already been preserved. The move was appealed by the family and supporters. When everything goes wrong and the case goes cold, there is just one flicker of hope. Science. A research institute in Shizuoka is currently working on establishing a more detailed look of the perp 
based on DNA left at the crime scene. According to a scientist working on this case, there is a possibility of figuring out if the perpetrator had any illness, what is his skin color, and even details about his facial features. Could this mean we will finally get an answer on who the culprit is? The police remain skeptical. Contrary to the United States, which was built on immigrants, Japan is a homogenous country. That means there isn't a lot of interest in finding out the family roots. Stay tuned again next week for another episode of the True Crime Tales. Be safe and see you again next time.